Hello, welcome to PCAP's Native Prairie Speaker Series. My name is Caitlin Rose Seiler and I am the Stewardship Coordinator with Saskatchewan Prairie Conservation Action Plan or PCAP. Today, Taylor Kell, Agri Environmental Technician with Moose Jaw River Watershed Stewards, will be talking about preventing the spread, applying biosecurity measures for invasive weeds. Just a little bit of housekeeping before we begin. PCAP's Native Prairie Speaker Series is a monthly presentation and has anything to do with native prairie conservation or species at risk. And we have a great lineup of speakers scheduled covering topics such as bees, birds, and bats. Join us on April 20th for a presentation about prairie pollinators by Sarah Semler from the Living Prairie Museum. On May 11th, Phil Rose from the Alberta Conservation Association will be speaking about greater sage grouse and grass on songbirds. And on June 8th, Corey Olson from the Alberta Community Bat Program will be talking about bats. And you can register for these webinars through the PCAP website. All past presentations can be found on the PCAP YouTube channel, and this webinar will be uploaded there in the near future. I'd like to start by saying we respectfully acknowledge that we are on the traditional territories of many Indigenous nations and communities, past and present. For a millennia, they have worked to protect these landscapes and the life these areas sustain. I would like to thank these original caretakers and acknowledge the ongoing work and presence of Indigenous peoples in Canada today. I'd also like to take a moment to note that financial support for today's webinar is provided by our presenting sponsors, Eco-Friendly Sask, Pembina Pipelines, Saskatchewan Cattlemen's Association, Sask Energy, SaskTel, and Wildlife Habitat Canada. Our supporting sponsors are Camp Wolfolo and Ranchers Stewardship Alliance, Inc as well as Environment and Climate Change Canada. And a reminder to all of our listeners out there that you'll be muted for the duration of the webinar. If you have any questions during the presentation, please feel free to type into the questions section of the webinar dashboard at any time, and questions will be answered at the end of the webinar. If you're on the cell phone app, you can send your question by chat to the organizer. Now a bit about today's presenter. Taylor Kell, Agri-Environmental Technician at the Moose Jaw River Watershed Stewards. She attended the University of Regina and will be graduating this spring with her Bachelor of Science majoring in Biology with a focus in environment, Environmental Ecology from the University of Regina. She was born and raised in Moose Jaw. Taylor is deeply passionate about environmental conservation and enjoys spending time outdoors, camping and hiking. So with that, I'd like to pass it over to Taylor. Okay, are you seeing my screen? Yes. Okay, perfect. I'm just going to... Okay, well, hello everyone. Um, I would like to thank the Prairie Conservation Action Plan for hosting this webinar today. And I'd like to thank our co-sponsor, Sask Energy. I'd also like to thank everyone for participating today. As Caitlin has stated, my name is Taylor Kell, and I am the Agri Environmental Technician at the Moose Jaw River Watershed Stewards. And I will be talking about biosecurity and applying biosecurity measures to invasive terrestrial plants. So first of all, I would like to quickly introduce the Moose Jaw River Watershed Stewards and what we do. We are a local nonprofit charitable organization, and our mandate is source water protection. Our main focus is the protection and education of water in the Moose Jaw River watershed. We have numerous projects that we are currently working on, including our education programs, the Co-op Food Forest, Build and Drainage Project, and the Canadian Agricultural Program. We also monitor our water for an aquatic invasive species and spread awareness on terrestrial invasive species. Feel free to visit our website, uh, mjriver.ca, or .com, I believe it is. <laughs> and uh, and our social media for more information on our watershed and what we do. On the slide here, it shows the region that we cover. We are one of 12 watershed groups in Saskatchewan, and this is our slice of Saskatchewan. It is a fairly large region, and we also assist some rural municipalities in the big muddy watershed just south of us. Here's an outline on how to manage your invasive species. This presentation is focused on biosecurity, but I cannot talk about biosecurity without speaking on the other two steps. I will quickly go over what invasives are and how to identify some of the common weeds that we find in our region. I will then go over biosecurity and lastly, some control options. Throughout the presentation, I will show you pictures of different invasive species to get you more familiar with what some of them look like. 
I will start with this slide. The flower here pictured is the nodding thistle. All of, um, sorry, all of the photos and of uh, plants were taken by me in our watershed or very close to our watershed. If you would like to learn more on identification, there are previous webinars done by PCAP. And if you want to learn more about controlling invasive species, I know there's an upcoming webinar about biocontrol that is hosted by some of the other watersheds, and I'm more than happy to send links to those webinars after the program. So there's our famous, well, locally famous Moose Jaw River watershed truck, and then of course the, the nodding thistle. What are invasive species? Invasive species is an organism not native or indigenous to a particular area. Most of you are familiar with invasive species and the problems that they can cause, but for those less familiar, I will go over a brief introduction. Invasive species can cause great ecological and economic harm. And for the purpose of this webinar, I will be focusing on invasive terrestrial plants, not invasive animals. In our watershed, we have had many invasive species, such as leafy spurge, baby's breath, bindweed, Canada thistle, and many, many more. And this picture is actually a baby's breath before it has gone to seed in its vegetative state here. And this was taken in Waccamaw Valley, Moose Jaw. Recognize the weed. As I had mentioned, the first step in, 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 sorry, the first step in fighting invasive species is awareness and education. A part of awareness is recognizing the invasive weeds. So this one here is a common burdock. But the important thing about learning about invasives is always being open to learning more, looking for more opportunities to become more educated and to continue to monitor your own land or any land that you are visiting. Common burdock is this one specifically is very harmful for wildlife, specifically deer. It will often bunch around the deer's genitals, making it hard for them to reproduce. And if they get way down, to, way down enough by the burrs, it can even cause death. And again, this picture was taken in Waccamaw Valley Moose Jaw. <laughs> so next up is uh, my arch nemesis, uh, Leafy Spurge. I feel like I have a personal vendetta against this plant, as I'm sure many others feel as well. This plant has been a nuisance in our watershed and is taking over many areas, such as ditches, railways, and most importantly, native prairie. However, you will not find it on cultivated land. It is highly recognizable by the lime green yellow color. And if you step, snap the stem, it will have a milky latex substance ooze out of it. And the plants turn a reddish brown in the fall. It can spread by fragments of the root, or by the seeds, which explode from the seed pods up and can spread up to five meters. So in the first picture here, I think I have my pointer, yep. So this is a close up, then a little bit farther back, and then you can see these bunches of leafy spurge spreading. And I believe all of these were taken in Waccamaw Valley Moose Jaw. Purple loosestrife. This plant hardly needs a hardly needs an introduction as it's made itself famous. It's of course famous for its beauty, but also for how rapidly it can spread and cover entire rivers. We have identified purple loosestrife in our watershed, specifically in Waccamaw Valley and Moose Jaw. We hosted a volunteer day and had 10 people come out on a hot August day to help us pull and bag the purple loosestrife. We are hoping to stay on top of the plants year after year and continue to monitor the river. If anyone is interested in joining us this year for the poll, please let me know after the webinar and I will sign you up. It will likely be in late July or early August to pull the plants when they are flowering, but before they have gone to seed. According to the Ontario Invading Species Awareness Program, each plant can produce 30 flowering stems and 2.7 million seeds yearly. They form dense mats that can choke out vegetation. And the reason that we hand pull them is because they are a riparian plant and they are too close to water bodies to apply herbicides. And this is from the poll this year. That's me and that is our education co coordinator, Kayla, and he worked with us last summer. The next plant on our list is bindweed. It's another invasive species that we have a lot of in our watershed. It is found more in the southern part of our watershed. I have personally seen it in the RMs of Moose Jaw, Bailden, and Terrell, or Terrell, um, although I'm sure it's prevalent in other RMs as well. This plant forms a dense mat and it will literally choke out other vegetations and other plants 
if you look in this third picture here, you can see, kind of see it, it's hard to see a bit, but it's uh, crawling up a grass and twisting around it as it goes, and it is slowly strangling it. It is doing this to hog all the photosynthesis for itself, and it will prevent the grass from being able to photosynthesize once it's no longer exposed to light. This is a huge problem because it also spreads from fragments. Bindweed is often prevalent on roadsides and ditches here, so when the mower comes along and cuts it, it continues to spread it as it goes. It can also get it can also cover the mower and cause damage to the mower because it is a vine-like plant. This is one of my favorite yet least favorite pictures I have ever taken. It was taken at Buffalo Pound Provincial Park in the summer of 2017. Uh, this is out of our watershed, but only by about 20 minutes or so. This picture contains four invasive species. So the purple flowers you see up here are Dame's Rocket. This large leaf down here is common burdock, as I showed before with the big burrs. And then you can see absinthe in here as well. So it's just a little bit, but those are the absinthe leaves. So that's your, our third one. And then right here is some type of thistle. I personally can't identify it from this picture. I'm sure someone could. Um, it could potentially be a native thistle, but judging by the crowd it hangs around, I'm going to have to go with an invasive thistle as well. Okay, so the next plant is an awareness example of how important awareness is and just what awareness can do. Yellow flag iris. It's a beautiful ornamental plant that was likely introduced as a pond plant, and I can see why. I think it's absolutely gorgeous. So a farmer in our watershed, who we've been working with in the past to help manage her leafy spurge on her land, contacted the watershed with what she thought was yellow flag iris. She was on a canoe trip down the river when she discovered the plant. She took the GPS location as well as pictures and sent them to us. Our friends at the Moose Jaw River and Adventure Tours lent us a canoe to check out the site. We located, cut down, and dug as much as the root as we could. Uh, we were in a canoe while doing this, so it's pretty hard to dig from a canoe. <laughs> um, but we put the plant material we could find in the canoe. We tried to make sure none of it went downstream. And after returning, we bagged all the plant material and then wiped the canoe down with Lysol wipes. The farmer had indeed identified a new invasive weed. So here's some more pictures of it. Um, many of you from Saskatchewan may not have heard of yellow flag iris. It is not listed on our Invasive Species Control Act. It is not listed as a noxious or a prohibited weed. However, it is considered an invasive in Ontario, Manitoba, Alberta, British Columbia, and North Dakota. So all of our neighbors and more. Thanks to this farmer's awareness and education on invasive species, we were able to locate the plant early and hopefully prevent it from establishing and spreading. We reported the plant to IMAP Invasives and plan on revisiting the site for years to come. And these pictures were also taken in Waccamaw Valley Moose Jaw. Why should we care? According to the PCAP website, there are only 17 to 21 percent of native prairie left in Saskatchewan. It is one of the most vulnerable ecosystems on earth. Because of the fertile land in the prairies, most has been lost to agriculture, industry, and urban centers. Because of the vulnerability of these ecosystems, we must protect the species that are endemic to our area or the species that rely on native prairie. Without the native plants, we often lose much of our native wildlife. Many of the species, if lost, will be lost forever. So why exactly do invasive species threaten our native species? Well, invasive species have characteristics that make them able to flourish in a variety of environments. In this picture here, there's a very small amount of soil next to a pole surrounded by asphalt, but yet bindweed and absinthe were still able to flourish in this area. Um, many of our native plants would not be, that wouldn't be a suitable habitat for them, obviously. Because of their ability to flourish wherever they can they outcompete native plants, especially plants that aren't adaptable, such as species at risk? Ecosystems are very vulnerable and rely on various systems. If one system collapse, collapses, so do others. Invasive species quickly take over the environments that they are in, and this displaces the native vegetation and in turn displaces native wildlife and other organisms. If we protect our ecosystems and work with our ecosystem, they will continue to thrive, produce, and endure. 
So that being said, we've done some work in the past with invasive species. As many of you could probably guess, invasive species are a bit of a passion of mine, considering I have pictures going way back to 2017 of them <laughs> that I could easily find. Um, but I thought we'd go over some of the work that we've done at the watershed. So previously, we had a demonstration site in the arm of Karen to help determine the best herbicide to use on leafy spurge. A few years ago, we had an integrated management workshop on how to manage your inva invasive species with a variety of controls. Last year, we worked with Sask Energy to develop invasive species identification key tags, which are shown here on the slide. They have a picture, identification, and the symbols at the bottom represent the types of controls that you can use for each plant. So for this Canada thistle example here, of course, it has the um, picture. It shows a bit of the, how you can identify it, the leaves and how much seeds it produced. And then this hand here represents manual pulling. This is an insect control, so that means there is an insect that can help with it. This is a, means grazing animals can help. And this last spray bottle uh, means that you can use chemical controls on them. And then uh, we have collected leafy spurge beetles with other watersheds, which I'll go into more on the next slide. But the picture on the left is the, or on the right, sorry, is the nets that we use to collect leafy spurge beetles. We also monitor our lakes, and by lakes in our case, we mean the Watson Reservoir in Avonlea, um, and we monitor it for zebra and quagglet mussels in the summer months. And lastly, we have passionately promoted invasive species awareness on our website and our social media. The leafy spurge beetle collection. Um, every year at the beginning of July, the Old Wives Watershed Association, Swift Current Creek Watershed, South of the Divide Con Conservation Action Program, and the Moose Jaw River Watershed Stewards team up to collect beetles at Basant Campground near Mortlach, Saskatchewan. We collect them at the start of July. This is when the beetles are active and above ground to breed. We use sweep nets, which was pictured here, that's a sweep net. Um, collect these beetles, filter out any bugs and stems, and then we put them in these brown paper bags. And then we tape the seams and then tape them again. So that's what you'll see there. Um, because they will get out otherwise. <laughs> and then they go into a cooler, which will calm them down until they arrive at their destination. And we are hoping to expand this program this year. So as you can see, there's a few different species of flea beetles in here, and I think they look pretty excited for their new home. Okay, so now that the background of invasive species is done, I'm sure many of you are, after hearing the title of the webinar, were curious about why, what exactly is biosecurity. So biosecurity refers to measures made to prevent the introduction or spread of harmful organisms. And this can be applied at different scales. Biosecurity is a term that we don't commonly use, but the concept is something that many of us are already aware of and not realize that it's biosecurity. Biosecurity can be applied at a global scale, a country scale, provincial, and even just between your pastures in your various pastures that you own, or even between different roadsides. I've actually already provided an example of biosecurity, but you might not have realized. The yellow flag iris. The process we took to dispose of the iris was actually taking steps in biosecurity. We identified the plant, we removed the plant, then we disinfected the materials we used, such as the canoe and the scissors, to prevent any seed or fragments that we hadn't seen from re-entering the water body. We then reported the findings and properly disposed of the plant material. I dried the plants out in bags and then burnt them away from any vulnerable land or ecosystems. And here is the yellow flag iris in the canoe. We had caught it just in time. It had gone to seed, but the seed pods hadn't opened up yet. So that's it there. So why is biosecurity important? At this point, I hope many of you realize the imp importance of preserving what little native prairie we have left. After awareness and education, biosecurity is the next step. It is preventing the spread of invasive species. The health and biodiversity of our ecosystems relies on preventing invasive species from spreading to environmentally sensitive areas. We can all do our part in preventing the spread. Biosecurity is not a new concept and it has been applied by many countries, provinces, and even rural municipalities. I will speak about some examples of biosecurity uh, just to give you guys an idea of what it exactly it is. And here's another picture of an invasive found in our watershed. It is scentless chamomile. It's another beautiful plant. Uh, this wasn't in Waccamaw, but it was in the RM of Mishja. So Australia, um, it's hard to talk about biosecurity without mentioning Australia. 
Australia is one of the major leaders of biosecurity in the world. Uh, Australia is essentially a large island, of course it is a continent, but islands are always extremely sensitive to invasive species. Many of the species on islands are endemic, meaning they aren't found anywhere else in the world. Australia has had many examples of invasives that have caused major problems, such as the introduction of rabbits and then cats to remove those rabbits. And now they will refuse any shipments of anything that is any type of seed. They will thoroughly inspect any shipping container and will reject entire shipments if any plant material is found. They are the leaders in prevention because they know the importance of the species contained in Australia. And this quote here was taken from the Australian government, Department of Agriculture, Water and the Environment. So this next example, um, I'm not sure if we even realize it's biosecurity, but wearing a mask and hand sanitizer and social distancing are all examples of biosecurity. Um, of course, biosecurity is the prevented, preventive measures of, of preventing the spread of organisms. And of course, um, COVID is a virus, but the same concept applies. Um, so yeah, by wearing a mask and hand sanitizer social, and social distancing, we are all participating in biosecurity. And this is a picture of my cat. He's showing the importance of wearing a mask. <laughs> So I'm sure many of you are aware of the Clean Drain Dry program. This is another example of biosecurity, and it is a Canada-wide program, but each province implements the program in different ways. In Saskatchewan, you may see signs like this. You may also see signs at the boating docks, stickers, or other advertisements. The advertising itself is education and awareness, but biosecurity is the act of cleaning, draining, and drying your equipment. This is a biosecurity measure to prevent the spread of aquatic invasive species, specifically zebra and quagga mussels. Again, biosecurity is the preventative measures taken to prevent an introduction or spread of a harmful organism. This is a biosecurity measure that the general public must do to prevent the spread. We also have conservation officers to monitor the borders, as well as people with disinfected trailers to travel where needed to, to decontaminate boats. We saw this concept and we wanted to apply it to preventing the spread of invasive terrestrial plants. This is where we teamed up with Sask Energy. Sask Energy had many pro protocols for preventing the, sp the spread of club root. They created a biosecurity protocol to keep club root contained. We worked with them to adjust these club root protocols and convert them to be applicable to terrestrial invasive species. Sorry. <laughs> so we are we spreading awareness uh, through our webinar today and through the making of this deco that you'll see here on the left. I'm just going to circle it. <laughs> um, so we're trying to educate people on the steps that they can take to prevent the spread. Today I won't be speaking on controls to manage your invasives, but rather what you can do to keep your invasives from spreading further or from spreading to other land, other pastures and other roadsides. This decal is meant to serve as a reminder to be aware of where you are going, to be aware of the invasives in your area, and to watch your equipment and vehicle for any signs of invasive species. And I'm gonna break down the sticker part by part here. The first part of the sticker, it says plan ahead, prevent the spread. So know, know if you're going to an area with invasive species presence. You can do this by asking the landowner or by checking IMAP invasives. IMAP Invasives is the program we use in Saskatchewan to track invasive species and to be aware of their location. Um, I know that Alberta and Manitoba have their own programs, but and they don't use IMAP Invasives. Second step is remove. So before leaving a site with invasives, check for soil and plant material in your tires, your wheel wells, your bumper, your grill, and your, your equipment, your boots, your animals, or anything else that might have been in contact with them. This is the most important step. Just by removing visible plant material and mud, you can reduce the spread of invasives by 95% or more, according to the Sask Energy Biosecurity Protocol. Okay, wash is the next step. Um, so wash your wheels, your wheel wells, your grill, your bumper with pressurized water. Many farmers do have a pressurized washer, and if you do or have access to a car wash, wash your vehicle if you've been in an area with invasive species or if you are going to an environmentally sensitive area. If you don't have a pressure washer, even rinsing the wheels and the bumper with water could help. 
And then here's another invasive. Um, for those curious, it is orange hawkweed. And we found this in Moose Jaw, not in Waccamaw, but uh, in the ditch by Dairy Queen. <laughs> So then the, then the last step, report. You must have a, an account to report the invasives. You can request an account and sign up. It's an easy to use app once you have an account. You can take a picture and report it where you are. The app will take your GPS location and upload it. If you would rather, you can also email your pictures, findings, and GPS location of the plants to invasives.imap at gov.sk.ca and they will input the data for you into the growing database. This picture here, this screenshot, was uh, taken from iMaps yesterday. It shows the distribution of invasives, and of course no one has mapped the entire province, so some areas have more invasive species present just because those areas have been more surveyed and mapped better. The largest dots represent over 10,000 species, then less than 10,000, less than 1,000, less than 100, and finally the smallest dots represent less than 10 species. So oh, plan ahead, prevent the spread. If you subscribe to our mailing list at oides.ca, mjriver.ca, if you subscribe before the end of April, we will send you a decal. When you, if you would prefer not to subscribe to our emails, I promise we don't bombard you, <laughs> but if you would prefer not to, you can just email me at taylor.kel at mjriver.ca. Just please state your name, your mailing address, and how many you would like, and I'd be happy to send this out to you, as our goal is awareness and preventing the spread. If you're around Moose Jaw, you can stop by. Please call ahead, though, as our office is close to the public. Please wear a mask and practice social distancing if this is the option you are choosing. We will make sure someone is there to give you a decal. These are stickers, so the backside is sticky. You can put them on whatever you'd like, but we are hoping for people to put them in a visible place in their vehicle where they will be reminded to watch for invasives or on your trailer or other equipment. So this is the decal itself, printed and ready to go. I wanted to state some of the work we are doing in the future with invasives. We will continue monitoring our river, of course. We have recently purchased a drone that will hopefully, hopefully assist us in this. If anyone notices new invasives or even just concerns about the river, please let us know. The watershed is so large that it is very helpful to hear from people on the ground in their own region. We will continue to report the invasives that we find. We will continue to monitor for aquatic invasive species in the Watson Reservoir by Avonlea, but we're also adding Plaxton's Lake and Moose Jaw to monitor for aquatic invasive species as well. And then our Leafy Spurge Beetle Collection Day. Um, this day has always been a very popular one for us at the watershed and our demand for beetles is greatly exceeding our manpower. We have recently purchased new beetle collection nets, uh, pictured here with our new logo. I think they look great. And we're hoping to have some volunteers come out to do some sweeping of the bugs. Uh, I promise I will do the dirty work with handling the bugs, but if you could just come out and do some sweeping, it will be greatly appreciated. And we hope to start a colony in Waccamaw Valley as well. As I stated earlier, we are planning to monitor the purple loose strife that we had found and do another large poll this summer. And lastly, we also assist farmers with the Canadian Agricultural Program, which has funding available to manage invasive species. And I will quickly give you guys some information on the targeted grazing BMP for those interested as well. What is the Farm Stewardship Program? Um, the purpose of the Farm Stewardship Program is to incent producers to implement BMPs that enhance sustainability and resilience in the sector. The Farm Stewardship Program focuses on four outcomes, demonstrated improvements on water quality, demonstrated reduction in greenhouse gas emissions, enhanced resilience of the agricultural sector, and biodiversity maintained. As with these as with all programs, applicants are responsible for complying with any regulatory requirements, including obtaining any required permits or approval. And that's where I come in. If you are interested in the Farm Stewardship Program, I can take you through the process and look to see if there's any permits that you need that you might not have known about. Um, so you can feel free to contact me. But this is the one I wanted to highlight today, the Invasive Plant Biocontrol and Targeted Grazing BMP. So here are some goats here and they are eating common tansy, which we have found a little bit in our watershed, but it's more prevalent up north. 50% of eligible costs to a maximum of $45,000 a year is available for targeted grazing. So for targeted small ruminant grazing, uh, there's $40,000 available. 
a year. And for insect biocontrol, there's $5,000 a year available. It's for producers and pasture grazer, grazing associations to contain and manage large scale invasive plant infestations through the support of integrated non-herbicide practices. Infestations where herbicide application is not environmentally feasible or practical are targeted through this BMP. And a BMP represents best management practices, if in case anyone was wondering. So if anyone is interested in the invasive plant biocontrol and targeted grazing BMP, also contact me and I will help you go through the application process as well. So that's it for me. I'd like to thank everyone for attending and listening to me rant about one of my favorite subjects. <laughs> So my contact information is here. That's my email and that is my work phone. If anyone has any questions about anything, um, you can of course enter them here, um, but you can also email me at a later date and I will try to answer them to the best of my knowledge. So thank you everyone. Thank you so much for the awesome presentation. It was so good. And your images are beautiful. Like it's so hard to get good pictures of invasive weeds and, and you nailed it. Oh, <laughs> it's really, you. really good. <laughs> thank you so much. Um, we have a few questions from listeners already that have, have typed in. Um, a listener named Rennie is wondering, um, it's a question regarding yellow flag. Do you have a plan for long-term monitoring to see if the plant has spread further downstream or if it came from up? stream well that's a great question um and i i know renny he's a great guy <laughs> so <laughs> hi renny um but uh yellow flag iris yeah so we've only discovered the one plant um thankfully from that producer uh we're gonna go upstream and downstream uh, i have a kayak and so we use that um, but we also have that partnership with the moose jaw adventure uh tours in Waccamaw Valley and they have uh, graciously offered to loan us a canoe whenever we'd like. So I would like to do some monitoring on, on the river and go up and down uh, a kilometer or so both ways. And then eventually we want to start using the drone. Uh, it's, uh, it has a great camera and it's, I love this drone, it's so exciting, um, but to go up and down to uh, view any new plants or new establishments. But yeah, I guess the main plan is to be watching the river, canoeing and monitoring it. Wow, that's so interesting. Um, are, is, are drones commonly used for invasive species work or is that something special that you guys are doing there? Um, I don't know. We uh, thought it would be good for our advertising and it's uh, the camera is so good that I think it will at least flag some areas that we can go check by ourselves after we look. So I don't yeah. know if other people do it, but we do. <laughs> Yeah, and the quality of the image is good enough that you can identify like, oh, that looks like a potential plant and. Um, yeah, just, just to give us some idea. Awesome, that's so neat. And do you know how to drive the drone? Yeah, we've been practicing <laughs> it. We um, are hoping to use it to also take pictures of our uh, co-op food forest that is going in at Prince Arthur School. So we just took it out the other day uh, to take some before images before we break ground on that project. Cool. Oh, that's really neat. I'll have to check out your social media after and look for some drone pictures. Yes, of course. <laughs> yeah, we have a question from a listener named May. Um, how do I tap into information about possible harvest locations for leafy spurge beetles in Saskatchewan watersheds? And where do you source spurge beetle sweep nets? Oh, okay. Well, great. So actually, uh, Basand Campground is the only place um, that I'm aware of that you can collect leafy spurge beetles. It has had an established colony for years. And so you can take as many beetles as you want and they'll still come back. Um, I shouldn't say that. There is obviously some limits to that. Uh, just outside Mortlach, um, if you have a problem with leafy spurge, you can contact your local watershed. And a lot of the watersheds will just collect the beetles themselves and give it out to producers in their area. Um, I've looked into finding leafy spurge beetles myself and I think it's very hard to do because you do have to establish colonies. We are looking to make our own colony in Waccamaw um, just because there's so much leafy spurge in Waccamaw and uh, there's so many people interested in more beetles so it'd be great to have another colony. Um, and as for our nets, we actually got them from Pro Metal Industries in Regina. They printed our logo on it and everything. They had a great price and they were local and they're an indigenous owned company. Okay, awesome. And that was Pro Metal Industries? Yes, that's right. Okay, perfect. 
Hopefully that answers the question for May. Um, the next question regarding uh, leafy spurge from Davis, what sort of response are you seeing in leafy spurge populations from biocontrols? Does population density or area impact F, um, efficiency? Okay, so that's a great question. Um, we have two people in our watershed that have been applying leafy spurge beetles year after year. Um, there's a woman in the RM of Bilden who has been on it and is always ready to put more beetles on her land. And she actually has a, a colony established. They're, they've been coming back now instead of uh, just reapplying, they actually live on her land and they keep coming back and breeding. Uh, she said she has noticed uh, some reduction um, it's obviously, they don't eat the whole plant because leafy spurge is their home, um, but it does help in keeping them from reproducing. And uh, we also have the Mortlach sheep pasture. Uh, they don't use any chemicals. They um, use their sheep to graze the plants and we add leafy spurge beetles to their operation as well. And with those biocontrols, they have seen a great reduction. Um, I can't use exact numbers, but I, it would be great to see um, if we could do counts. It would be great to have exact numbers, but people have said that they've helped reduce. Mm, good to know. Um, Lisa is wondering if you have any flowering rush in your area and how do you approach control? Um, actually, I don't know of any flowering rush in our area. Um, I think that's more to the north. I actually have never seen one in person. Okay, well, that that's a good thing then. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah. Um, Bowie is wondering, um, from your experience, which species is the most threatening or which species is spreading fastest? Um, that's a difficult question because um, it depends on the environment and the ecosystem. Um, of course, Levy Spurge doesn't thrive as well as um, Purple Loose Stripe does near water, but uh, Leafy Spurge has been spreading. Uh, fastly and um, in the sandier areas to the east of uh, Moose Jaw, it really, really spreads. Baby's breath has been awful for spreading, um, especially in the RMs of Wheatlands and RM of Karen, which is by Mortlach and uh, Karen. Um, but it doesn't seem to come as far east. So it kind of depends on what the environment the plant is in. Um, and yeah, like what are what if it's being left untouched or if people are controlling? Um, but I would say just for us, leafy spurge is really bad. And um, yeah, I'd say that one's the worst for most widespread. And I've seen it establish a native prairie a lot lately too, which is getting concerning. Yes, definitely. Um, May is wondering how do you deal with knapweed? Oh, Russian knapweed. Um, I I don't I'll have to think about that one. Um I know for a fact do not do not <laughs> go in with a um anything to chew up the soil um because as you're rototilling it will uh spread the roots more because it can reproduce that way. Um I know my own mother had to try that and now she's got a big issue. Um I would say chemical for Russian knapweed and if you're uncomfortable with chemical there's uh you could look into options for specific beetles and bugs that could um, help but I would say hand pulling of course um, but if it is hard to pull them and chemical would be the best options for Russian knapweed. Great thanks for that answer um, and then there's a listener named I believe it's Polly part of my pronunciation if, if I got that wrong um, uh, and Polly is with the Saskatchewan Network for Alternatives to Pesticides and um, she says I understood that the Moose Jaw area eliminated lithurium from the river valley once before with beetles and that's what they're doing in eastern Canada and I understand that Ducks Unlimited had organized this in Manitoba and helped with it in Saskatchewan however I haven't been able to find a recent source for those beetles um, and it would be useful to know do you know anything about that by chance yeah actually um, my coworker Stephanie uh, she told me yesterday about this program and we hadn't neither of us had heard about it it happened in 1999 so uh i was about two years old so um i can definitely look around in moose jaw and uh ask people that i know have been passionate about the river and see if there's any more information um and i can if you'd like to send me an email i can email you what i find when i find something Sure, that would be great. Um, and then she's also commented just in response to the last question, in Colorado, they worked with beetles for knapweed. 
Um, so that's quite interesting too. Thanks for sharing oh, that. That is great. Yeah. Um, Gail from Regina is wondering, or she says, thank you, Taylor, for an excellent talk identifying and measures to prevent spread of invasives. I'm hoping to encourage city dwellers to watch your presentation online on what to look for and do in their backyards or when they go camping and hiking. Um, yeah, that's a great comment from Gail. <laughs> yes, thank you, Gail. Um, how, um, how have you had, how much success have you had with the IMAP invasives? Do you find there's a really good uptake in, in Moose Jaw for people to report and invasives there? I find that you have like a select few people that are extremely passionate about IMAP invasives and they will go out and they'll map everything that they can. Um, for a lot of the times, uh, I feel like especially in rural areas, a lot of it's word of mouth. So a lot of guys will come up to me and say, hey, I found this here, um, like just so you know. So a lot of it's like that. So I find that uh, the watershed does a lot of the IMAP invasives uh, it actually inputting the data ourselves, but um, usually someone else has found the plant first and then we just um, put it in, go and check it out and then put it into IMAP ourselves. Um, but I think it's a great tool that people need to utilize more. It just helps us know what's in the area and what to look out for. Absolutely. And this presentation has been a good reminder for me to download it to my new phone and oh, <laughs> I'll yeah. be all ready for spring <laughs> for invasive species season. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, another listener, listener is wondering if um, IMAP invasives, is it connected to the EDD maps database? Um, Alberta and some other provinces are already connected to um, EDD maps. I don't know the answer to that. I've never heard of that, actually. Yeah, I guess we'll have to look into it. I've never heard of it either. Interesting. <laughs> um, May is wondering if you have a plant this instead brochure for people buying garden plants um, or other information related to pollinator mixes that are on the market that contain invasives. Uh, no, we don't have a brochure. Um, I We do post on social media every now and then about it. Um, I, yeah, I would just urge people to look through their their mixes. When things say wildflower mixes, they are rarely wildflower mixes because they are produced somewhere that has different wildflowers than in Saskatchewan. Um, but I have personally purchased uh, wildflower seeds from Blazing Star Company. It's, um, I believe, in northern Saskatchewan. And uh, they have a bunch of different native seeds that you can buy and it has a little instructional manual of how to plant them. So if you're looking to plant wildflowers, I'd say look local. Mm -hmm. Good, good, good comment there. Um, I know that, and a few people have commented into. Um, thanks for that, Gail. Especially, um, Native Plant Society of Saskatchewan has a Grow This Instead wallet card. Um, so I'm going to make a note of that and put it on the the PCAP um, social media. That's a great reminder. And, um, yeah. I had, yeah, I have. Um, I'm trying to grow a little pollinator garden in my yard, and it's not doing too well, but. Um, I had a friend who purchased wildflower seeds and was very excited to try to, you know, do something good for pollinators. And I looked at the mix and it had baby's breath in it. And oh, oh, yeah. it was kind of heartbreaking to, <laughs> I'm sorry, I can't let you plant this. <laughs> yeah. um, no. it's, it's amazing how many people don't know. And, and that garden centers are still selling wildflower mixes that contain invasive species. And it's, it's very unfortunate. Yeah, and I know in, previously we have gone around to different greenhouses in Moose Jaw and told them, please don't sell anything with these species. And a lot of them were aware. Um, we have previously put up posters uh, in greenhouses as well. And I think that's something we should continue to do, actually. And I, Absolutely. Um, yeah. And and do it bigger. Like, it's awesome that you're doing it in Moose Jaw, but we need it in, you know, Swift Current and Regina and Saskatoon. We need it everywhere. <laughs> yeah, yeah, we do. Yeah. Um, Stephen is wondering if you have much experience with toad flax control and what you would suggest for uh, for control. Ooh, okay. So toad flax, I've uh, only ever seen three individual plants of toad flax. Uh, one was in the RM of Karen and one was in the RM of Pangman in the south. Um, so I, we've never really had like an infestation, just singular plants. And every time we found the singular plants, we've just pulled them and bagged them and made sure they wouldn't spread. Uh, so no, I can't, I don't know how to handle a wide, widespread infestation. Mm, yeah, it's a good question. And did you like double or triple bag it or was one bag enough? Um, so when we do it, we usually bag them and put them in um, the vehicle and then uh, let them dry out completely. And then I usually 
well, I always burn them. I don't like to put them in the dump because I just think they'll spread more uh, in there. And our Moose Jaw dump is located really close to the Moose Jaw River. So um, I usually burn them at my mom's land, which isn't near any native prairie or any uh, riparian areas, which she's thrilled about. But <laughs> um, yeah, so I usually just bag them once. I let them dry out completely and then burn them somewhere that it's not going to, if anything were to spread, it wouldn't uh, cause any issues. So near cultivated land or something like that. Oh, okay. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah, that was my next question about what you what you do with it afterwards. Yeah, yeah. so that's what I do. Yeah, um, there's a question here about um, if you collaborate with the Alberta Invasive Species Council, um, apparently they have a full uh, leafy spurge biocontrol program with the beetle for years now, and it's being adopted on in large scale pasture land. Um, I have talked to some people from them just because uh, some producers in our watershed were looking to purchase some beetles. Um, I wouldn't say we are collaborating, but we definitely do talk to those people. And um, yeah, they basically said um, if we wanted to come take some from their area when it was breeding season, we could. Um, but we have our own site that's way near, way closer. So we're just going to continue to take our beetles from the Basan campground. Mm, perfect. Um, and Rennie has written in, uh, the city of Saskatoon found a successfully established population of purple loosestrife beetles from the 1990s release site. They have been successfully moving the beetles from the wetland that they found them in and now into the South Saskatchewan River Valley. And he says, we are hoping in time these populations may become a source for biocontrol collections. We may need a few more years for the population to to um to grow and um you can contact me at me Wasson. so um that's really interesting well that's great i'm glad to hear that the, um our patch is still relatively small i think with uh, some determined volunteers we should be able to completely pull it um but yeah that's great news and um if if it keeps coming if we can't stay on top of it i would love to look into putting some beetles on that Yes, yes. Um, Joan is wondering, what would you suggest for Canada thistle, bull thistle, and horsetail in our community orchard? Um, for the thistles, again, I uh, do not rototill it. Uh, it seems to just spread it like crazy. I would, again, use uh, chemicals, and if you weren't comfortable with chemicals, I would hand pull them. Okay, that is good to know, especially about the rototilling. Mm-hmm. Yes. Um, we have a comment here from Polly. Um, I believe lithrum is also sold as an ornamental and so are yellow irises and others. And I think the Canadian Wildlife Service um, used to try to do something about the sale of potential invasives, but she doesn't know if they're still involved. Um, yeah, I, I'm not sure either. I'm kind of curious if um, maybe this is a question for like the invasive, um, invasive Species Council of Saskatchewan of how how we can better stop things from coming in through through nurseries and garden centers. Yeah, I think it needs to, to be a provincial wide operation to keep it out. Yes, yeah. And um, the listener from earlier um, about the ED, EDD maps has typed in, just go to eddmaps.org. So we'll have to check that out after. And <laughs> yes, learn a little bit more about it. it. <laughs> So thanks um, everyone's so much. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Thanks for sharing that, Cesar Cesarina. Pardon my my pronunciation. Um, I oh, we have another question just pop in. <laughs> um, Beverly Ann says I steward 15 acres of rolling native prairie, um, aspen bluffs and wetlands seven minutes east of Saskatoon, and is looking for volunteers for controlled um, burns, and has um, has her phone number there. So I'll just pass that on to to anyone who's interested. Um, Taylor, have you had success with getting volunteers out to uh, handpick weeds? It seems like there's there's lots of awesome volunteer opportunities these days and I don't know if weed pulling would be the top of my list but <laughs> <laughs> actually I was very happy with uh we had a few volunteers they um there's some really dedicated people in our watershed and they had emailed me and said if there's any volunteer opportunities we want to help you in any way so I said great do you want to pull weeds on a hot day in August <laughs> and uh she, yeah she said yes and so we've had a few volunteers and then I um pressure my family and siblings into coming out as well. So a lot of the time 
some of the volunteers are um our family but that's what family's for <laughs> yeah that's right yeah yeah i have actually done it with um volunteered to do some toad flax just kind of pulling along an old railroad track um near where i live in valmary and um and it was actually quite fun <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah and we give you water and you can take as many breaks as you'd like <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> Oh, that's good. Yeah. Um, and with COVID, have you found you've had trouble getting more volunteers or um, has the numbers been the same? People looking for new opportunities to kind of stay safe and, and be outside? And um, Yeah, I mean, we don't we haven't been asking for a lot of volunteers lately. Um, mm. I would say the weed pull is one of our major ones. And then for the Sleepy Spurge, this will be the first time that we're asking for volunteers for um, the beetle collection. Um, so I'd say it was a it was a decent response. A lot of people want to be outside and a lot of people want to help. And it's a great way to get outside and help without being uh, worried about the virus because, well, it's just way better to be outside. Um, with the numbers, of course, we have to take that into consideration. Uh, we don't want giant groups of 30 or anything like that. And uh, I think we'll always keep it below 10 until this clears up. Absolutely, absolutely, yes, yeah. And I am. Um, I have to mention you. Um, you were talking about the keychains that you did. I actually have a keychain sitting right beside me. Oh, great! <laughs> and I made a note. I was going to give it to a friend who's heading out into the fields, and I was like, oh yes, I have to pass this on to her. And it's a, it's a really, really great resource. Um, is there a way for people to get more of those keychains, or do you have more in production? <laughs> um, I have a giant box of them under my desk, so. So if anyone would like a keychain um, or a decal, please email me and I I can send it out to you with a decal, decal or if you want to stop by and collect them. Um, yeah, we still have, oh, I don't know, 200 maybe. Um, okay. I don't think we're planning to make any more, but um, there's still lots, so you guys can be first come, first serve. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they, I, I know they're really useful and just having that right at your hand especially when you don't have service to start googling something and double checking and yeah what a great resource that's awesome yeah we really like the keychains we have them on all our keys and um they're good for just quick quickly looking if you're not sure or if you can't tell between different thistles or something like that um i think they're a great resource yes Yes. Well, I think that's all the questions that we have from, from our listeners today. So um, I just want to sincerely thank you for the awesome presentation and your enthusiasm and passion for invasive weeds is uh, is really contagious. <laughs> well, thank, <laughs> so thank you so much for saying that and thank you for uh, hosting today. No problem. And to all of our listeners out there, we have our next webinar scheduled for April 20th about prairie pollinators. So hopefully you can all catch that webinar and check out our website for other upcoming um, Native Prairie Speaker Series webinars. Uh, when you leave today's presentation, a quick one minute survey will pop up. And if you don't mind filling it out, we sure appreciate your feedback. And we often look for suggestions for future speakers that way and um, use information to report back to our sponsors. Um, so with that, thank you so much, everyone, and have a great rest of your day.